Welcome to Your Cases on Hold, a JBJS podcast hosted by Antonia Chen and Andrew Schoenfeld. Here, we discuss the science of each issue of JBJS with an additional dose of entertainment and pop culture. Take us with you in the gym, on the commute, or most certainly, whenever your case is on hold. Welcome back, everyone, to Your Case is on Hold. This is episode 59. If you're listening the day we drop, this is June 4th for the June 5th issue of JBJS. Uh, Welcome back, and thanks for listening. For those who've been with us and already know, that's great, but for those who may be new, I am Andrew Schoenfeld, Deputy Editor for Methods at the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, and across the way, my erstwhile colleague, Antonio Chen, Deputy Editor of Adult Reconstruction. As always, the opinions you're going to hear in this setting are our own and not those of the Editor-in-Chief, the other Deputy Editors, the other Editors of Constituent Journals, or the Board of Trustees. It it is really uh, important for all of you to understand that. And then also we we do uh, depend on your good graces. This is not a a NPR uh, drive where we're going to ask you to donate money or anything like that. But if you can share the podcast with a friend, if you like what you hear, get other people engaged, give us a five-star rating if you can, like and subscribe so you don't miss any episodes. That really helps us out and it helps the journal out. So spread the spread the word uh, if you can. We would like to engage more listeners and we would like to engage uh, new people who can benefit from this content. Furthermore, uh, this episode is brought to you by JBGS CME. There's never a wrong time to be engaged in CME. You can get credits for a lot of the things that you're already doing. You can get clinical classroom. You can get credit for the the papers that you're reading for maintenance of certification. You can get credit for just the journal articles that that you're reading. It's kind of one-stop shopping. So definitely do check that out. This is the first issue in June. For those who are not aware, we have a new editor-in-chief. Dr. Bhandari uh, has uh, taken over for Dr. Swinkowski, who has moved into the editor emeritus position joining Dr. Tolo and Dr. Heckman after 10 years of uh, credible service uh, in that role. So um, congratulations to Dr. Swinkowski and welcome to Dr. Bondari. Uh, and that just brings us right into the top of the pile where we have Dr. Bondari's uh, welcome message, uh, be good, be present, be grateful, sort of giving you some insight into his he- editorial philosophy. And it's permanently free, so no matter when you're listening to us, you can always check this out. We then have anteromedial cortical support in reduction of trochanteric hip fractures from definition to application by Mao. And then what's important, retirement without exorcism. That's intriguing. We should have saved that one for the October issues. I need an old priest (laughs) and a young priest. (laughs) This is by Ostrom, uh, and it's permanently free. Hopefully, uh, you can retire without requiring holy work to exercise your demons. Next, we have Ortho Twitter or hashtag Ortho Twitter. I don't know. Blending information, education, and entertainment online by Chella Muthu. Uh, we're the only ones who are supposed to be blending information, education, and entertainment online. So uh, that should be rephrased. Your case is on hold. Blending information, education, and entertainment online. Then we have AOA Critical Issue Symposium, The Dynamic Environment of Healthcare by Lundy. That's it for what's uh, at the top of the pile. Let's move into the headlines. My headline in the news this week is The Hawkins Sign of the Talus, The Impact of Patient Factors on Prediction Accuracy by Griffin and colleagues. There is an infographic and it is 30 days free. So check it out yourself if you want to check the information that I'm going to be sharing with you uh, for this paper. Uh, I think this is a very nice paper. Um, One, it it delves into one of these uh, tried and true maxims of orthopedic eponyms uh, reaching back more than 50 years. And um, it provides some some additional uh, insights that I think have a lot of translational capacity to various uh, aspects of, of the orthopedic uh, field and orthopedic research. So some, some really interesting points to delve into using this paper as a substrate. 
So I, I think like Hawk and sign is one of like the first eponyms that like every third year medical student who wants to go into orthopedics learns. It's been in the literature since 1970 and, you know, is, is right up there. I think with like the near impingement and the uh, Apley test or the Apley maneuver, Lasag sign, you know, we're getting away from eponyms as the field evolves, but they're just some that, that always seem to, to be there. Anyway, this is a subchondral radiolucent line that appears in the Taylor Dome and is supposed to represent disuse osteopenia in vascularized bone. Now, obviously, in 1970, when this was developed, it was developed just in the setting of a, a clinical environment where they were just using x-rays. And you didn't have CT imaging, you didn't have MRI studies, you didn't have the whole panoply of all sorts of other imaging modalities that can be used to assess vascularity and bony structures. So it's a very rudimentary sign that's based on radiographs. And a positive sign is supposedly prognostically favorable, and it's considered to be a negative predictor of the development of Taylor osteonecrosis. So the first thing, you know, as someone who works in the spine field and basically is going to get like a CT or MRI on everyone who walks into my office, like, why are we still doing this? <laughs> like, haven't, haven't we moved beyond where we need to like be doing with the Hawkins sign getting like x-rays? I, I just feel like there's probably better ways to evaluate the vascularity given the, the multitude of imaging modalities that, that are available. And if there are like real questions, you can do nuclear medicine studies or PET CT or right. Like all the things that we well, do. Unless you don't have access. That's the only thing I could think of. Well, Sure. Yes, well, I mean, it goes without saying. It's not like this. <laughs> I'm just the boss. Out there, just in case. The info. Don't shut down my argument. <laughs> anyway, that's fine. <laughs> so, assuming we don't have the access, and we're going to still use the Hawkins sign, of which I'm obviously a little bit skeptical of. This is a diagnostic study at the at the end of the day, and so basically, they took 105 Taylor neck fractures which seems like a lot until you break down into the subgroups as, as it always does. You know, there are only 21 Taylor that had the Hawkins sign and then there are 84 that didn't. And they wanna do a diagnostic study, which is basically what's the diagnostic validity of the Hawkins sign. And then their subtitle is impact of patient factors on prediction accuracy. Well, I'll say at first, you can't assess the impact of patient factors on accuracy without a multivariable analysis or some type of, of analytic approach that's going to allow you to adjust for these things. But they right off the bat, they don't, they don't really have enough numbers, even with these 105 Taylor neck fractures, to get to that base level where you can do robust adjusted analyses. They only have 21 with the Hawkins sign, and then they only have 35 patients in total that developed osteonecrosis. So those numbers are, are pretty pretty limited. Further, when you, you want when you do a diagnostic test, there are three basic elements that have to be present. One is that everybody who's at risk is included, which I guess in this case, it, that that one is yes, but it's just not that many. Second, you really have to have the full gamut of clinical variation represented in sufficient numbers to allow robust testing. That means people with really severe Taylor fractures, the type four, you know, Taylor extrusion, or that might actually be a type five, but anyway, like very severe open injuries to the, the very slight, subtle, non-displaced Taylor neck fractures. And those have to be present, not just you have adequate representation you also have to have sufficient numbers in each of those groups. And that's hard to make that case when it's, when it's just 105 uh, patients. And then everybody has to be assessed with the gold standard for osteonecrosis, which is very difficult to do in a retrospective type study. They're not all, it, it, the people that are thought to have osteonecrosis are gonna get worked up for it. And the people who are, are felt to be okay, they're probably not gonna get worked up. So at least two of the three critical elements for, for a robust diagnostic study are, are not are not present in, in this context. All right, then their analyses are simple, bivariate, and they use Fisher exact testing. Why do they use Fisher exact? Because their numbers are so small. So whenever you start having 
cell sizes with less than 10 use Fisher exact testing instead of chi square because it's a more conservative test that, that is less sensitive to you know small numbers in any particular cells. It doesn't change just because you use Fisher exact, it doesn't immunize you against the inherent limitations associated with reduced sample sizes. And that's just they, they have a, a, an issue with their power because their conclusion is that the positive Hawkins sign is not a reliable predictor of preserved Taylor vascularity in all patients. And that's because they didn't find a statistical difference. However, let's just look at the numbers. Let's, let's drill down a little bit here, right? So their point estimate for osteonecrosis in the Hawkins sign is 14%. And that entire 14% were individuals who were smokers, apparently. It's only three patients. But um, then amongst those who did not have the Hawkins sign, it's almost a three time three times increase in risk, 38%. So 14 versus 38%, a larger sample, those are definitely different. Because the sample is small, the 95% confidence intervals overlap, and that's why you don't have the statistical finding. So I think this does show that there is, there is meaningful utility to the Hawkins sign. Their sample just couldn't detect it uh, statistically. So there's an issue with type 2 error there. Uh, as far as a diagnostic test goes and its ability to really assess patient factors and how those involve prediction accuracy, uh, I, I think there's there's a very low likelihood of, of achieving that in, in a sample of this size and with the other inherent limitations associated with this with this work. I think probably the best thing about this is that it should be an impetus, a call for our foot and ankle partners, get a larger data set look at this in a multi-center absolutely way. right being able to see this on a bigger scale would definitely potentially would definitely strengthen the conclusions for sure and and i think you will find that the hawkins sign is valuable still crazy hawkins still crazy after all these years just like paul simon like we're going back to 1970 they were on to something so let's let's amalgamate some some cohorts here the, these folks in kentucky i mean this is a the group, the author group is like their folks from Boston here, but it says the work was done in Kentucky. I'm assuming since it's just said it's all um, one trauma center, but get some more trauma centers in there. Hungry Hawkins needs more people on board. So yeah. <laughs> Hungry Hawkins wants a little bit more delivery. So plug for multi-center studies to your point. And I think that's true for any of these studies that have less people in it. And uh, that's a, Nice iteration to the study that I'm going to talk about next, which is ideal timing of reimplantation in patients with periprosthetic knee infection undergoing two-stage exchange, a diagnostic scoring system by Asion, and there's an infographic on this. So everyone's looking for the holy grail for markers for reimplantation for infection. And the goal for trying to identify these is to determine when you should reimplant a patient, because right now our markers aren't great. We look at ESR, we look at CRP, I aspirate my knees to personally, and if there's any growth on it, then I'm going to read spacer the patient. Um, otherwise, we're taking them back in. There have been studies looking, again, ESR and CRP and D-dimer are the big ones that people use, and then synovial fluid counts as well, too. So a previous study from the same group found that a synovial fluid white cell count of greater than 934 cells per microliter had certain sensitivity specificity, they were both pretty high, both 82. And then the relative synovial fluid uh, polymorphic nucleoside percentage of greater than 52% had 82% sensitivity and 78% sensitivity, and they were 78% specificity, and these are predictive of reimplantation. And as a spoiler alert, the study that they did here didn't really expand on their previous study as much. They found the exact same thresholds of 934 and a uh, polymorphic nucleoside percentage of 52%. So while the aims of the study were to evaluate the most appropriate thresholds for commonly investigated serum biomarkers and synovial fluid parameters in patients who underwent definitive reimplantation after receiving continuous antibiotic therapy for chronic knee PJI, and they're also their goal is to generate an evidence-based scoring system with optimized weight for the component indicators to predict the recurrence or persistence of periprosthetic knee infections after reimplantation. It was really not that different from their previous study. They contained 153 patients. Now, that is a good number for infection cases, but this is one of those areas where I would say, hey, it's a good idea. Let's bring a bunch of different groups together who have a bunch of different parameters and study infection in a multi-center uh, study setting. Uh, the definition of diagnosis. Opinion. Oh, so yeah. Difference of opinion. I think one one fifty three is very small for some for what they're trying to do. Oh yeah, so, no, so I think they should have a multi center study. Is what I'm saying. 
right? Like I think they would do much better with a much bigger group of people for what you're saying, especially to create a diagnostic criteria. Um, 153 is just not enough to get to that. They didn't specify the definition of diagnosis. The post-operative treatment regimen was pretty standardized, which is unusual but good in this type of setting. Um, two weeks of IV antibiotics and six weeks of oral antibiotics. They used continuous antibiotic treatment instead of stopping patients, and they didn't do an, an antibiotic holiday. They just kept them through antibiotics, and they reimplanted patients right afterwards. Their definition of success of treatment is not what I would typically use in these type of study settings. They define the absence of PJI as the di disappearance of all clinical microbiological and radiographic evidence of PGI accompanied by the normalization of CRP levels during the 96 week post-up follow-up period after the discontinuation of antibiotics. Um, there are definitions of success. Musculoskeletal Infection Society has a definition of success. You can be on antibiotics for that in all honesty. I'm not sure what radiographic evidence of PJI is to be perfectly honest. Typically it's just clinical microbiological and CRP values don't always normalize. But anyway, that's the definition that they used in this study. They didn't list the markers they evaluated in the methods part of the paper. So it's uh, one of those things where it'd be nice to be able to specify that. Some of the information in the results, for example, should be in the methods. This is just a little touch for my thing, but they said all patients continued antibiotic treatments for 15 days after reimplantation while waiting for intraoperative cultures to become available. That's the methods thing. They did have 96 week follow up, which is fantastic. So they found that the factors that predicted reinfection were a D-dimer level of 1,110 nanograms per milliliter and had a 74% sensitivity and a 61% specificity with an AUC of 0.69, which is not that, that high. Um, it is interestingly higher than the value that's typically published in literature for reimplantation numbers, which is 850 nanograms per milliliter. That was published in previous literature from a different group. Um, but it still didn't have great sensitivity specificity. They said that in their score calculator, uh, this had a beta coefficient of 1.5 points if you had over 1,110 on your D-dimer. They had the same snowy fluid white blood cell count of 934 that they found in their other study. Again, a low sensitivity by a higher specificity, and this had a beta coefficient of two points. And then the polymorphonucleoside percentage of greater than 52%, which is the same from our previous study, had a sensitivity of 73, but a specificity of 90%, and a beta coefficient of two points. So if you add these three variables together, and my biggest caveat with this is there's only three variables being included here. If a total score is greater than 2.75, they classify this as a patient with a high risk of infection recurrence. And they said the ability to discriminate infection recurrence was demonstrated by an AUC of 0.9, 95% um, confidence interval from 0.82 to 0.99. So with only three points, I find it really hard to use it as a calculator. It's one of those areas where it is really nice to have a marker for real implantation, but I don't think that's going to be the robust factor that we need. Now that said, other studies can be done to validate this using their own data set to see if those criteria are helpful for reimplantation to determine whether or not a patient will become reinfected. But another plug for multi-center studies in a much better, bigger patient population in order to come up with conclusions. So this, this study is just, it's going to get that, that big Lebowski where they're like, as a bonus, we're going to do a diagnostic scoring system. And my response is, no, don't, don't, don't say that. I was just thinking that we need more diagnostic scoring systems around knee infection. There are just, so, there's so many. There's so many already. There are a lot. There are a lot. But mm -hmm. the interesting thing is, so the scoring systems are typically for the diagnosis of infection. So to date, there's really no reimplant. Now, now, to be fair, we use the exact same diagnostic criteria for reimplantation. Should they be different? I don't know, and that's a great question. To be fair, a lot of us are moving away from two stages, honestly. We're doing this, you know, we call 1.5 stage or something like that, where you put a spacer in. If they're not clinically infected, then we're not going back in. So we don't necessarily need the reimplantation per se. So it might not be as relevant of a calculator to your point. And two, you can use the same diagnostic criteria that we used previously um, for diagnosing infection in the first place. Do we need a specific one for reimplantation? Hard to say. Also, when they're just three parameters, you don't need like the, you don't need the rubric of the score. It's almost like to dissect this, right. it's basically, if one of the two that's not D-dimer are positive, then they're at a high risk of infection recurrence. Like you don't need uh, some kind of, you know, magic scoring system around that. Literally just say that. 
you if it's D dimer plus any of the other two, it's for sure. If it's just D right. dimer alone, then you're probably in that uh opaque. Area. Area. But right. Right. like why do you need the, why do you need the 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 points? Like you don't need the points, you just need to say what it is. Yeah, and I agree with you. Most diagnostic I guess studies when it comes to infection will say the AUC is this when you combine these, you know, or, you know, if you combine all three of them, the AUC becomes this. If you combine two of these, the AUC is this, and then you can use that as your sensitivity and specificity to your point. So when it's just three things and it's just yes, no for each of them. Right. Also, right. I just, w w with studies like this, when they're so, so small, 153 is not a lot of variation. And that's why that's the AUC is so high. Yep. Like agree. if you did this in a thousand patients, it's not going to, the AUC is not going to hold up in a, in, in a thousand patients. So there is, there is restricted clinical variation and there's clinical truncation. And that's an artifact about why the AUC is as high as it is. It's just, you, you will not see that with just three parameters in a, in something as complex as reimplantation of implants after the infection. Absolutely. So I couldn't agree with you more. All right. So I think we're two for two. Cases on hold. Want to want to go for three? Uh oh. <laughs> Set this from a is the standpoint. cases on hold featurette. Racial and ethnic minority patients have increased complication risks when undergoing surgery while not meeting clinical guidelines by Lamaca and colleagues. The the folks in this research team, I'm like 50 50 already on their um, research capabilities. I know some of them. You might know some of them too, actually, especially the the senior yeah, my, author on this. My book. name may or may not be on this familiar. one. <laughs> Very familiar. Anyway, um, it's a it's a really interesting question that you know kind of gets at the the intersection of the space between healthcare disparities among racial and ethnic minorities and clinical practice guidelines, and and I think it, it brings up some you know challenging concepts. I'm going to give you my overarching um, insight and or in, my take on it. And then like, I certainly wanted to hear what you think about what my thoughts were. You know, briefly, and it is your study, so, so maybe you should be presenting it and not me, but fill in what I, what I, what I failed no, no, to No, no, this is actually better to hear from a perspective right. of someone. Right. I always it. like to hear what other people, like mm -hmm. with my work, like, right. So this is, this is the, this is the way it should be. This is the perfect situation. But, um, you know, large number of patients, 11,611 uh, undergoing primary total joint arthroplasty at uh, the Mass General Brigham Hospitals uh, between 2010 and 2020. And looking at race and ethnicity, and then the, the, the individuals who met clinical guidelines. So the, the patients were considered to meet the guidelines for undergoing total joints if they had a hemoglobin A1C of less than eight, BMI less than 40, and not currently smoking at the time of surgery. And then uh, they looked at amongst these, the patients who did and did not meet uh, based on racial and uh, ethnic and other sociodemographic factors. And then um, based on those factors, the, the impact regarding outcomes. Now, the first thing, I think these types of sociodemographic studies are always really challenging to do in the context of a single healthcare system, because there's there's just generally there's some degree of restricted variation. Now, depending on the system that you're working in, that can cut across different sociodemographic lines. But in our case, as we generally see in most studies that are coming out of Mass General Brigham, we have about like 90% of the population is white. And then the remaining 10% is is made up of other uh, minority groups. And that, that's obviously the case here. And I, I did some, some additional calculations myself that are not included in the table, but I thought were you know, somewhat illustrative. So of the total white patients, 10,389, 11% did not meet the guidelines when they underwent surgery. And then that number was 19% among Black African-American patients, 17% among Hispanic patients, and 18% among Asian patients. Now, the counterfactual here, of course, is that you're not seeing the patients who did not meet the guidelines and did not get the surgery. 
you're only seeing the patients who did not meet the guidelines and were then selected Correct. to. And experiment. that is the biggest caveat of the study that we understand, we acknowledge, and we actually set out to do the study with those patients to try to capture them. But that capturing those patients is actually very, very hard in our system. Oh yeah, no, totally, uh, exceedingly difficult to 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 be able to do that, or to even you know retrospectively kind of it it, it in some ways it's almost anachronistic because. It, let's just say, you know, someone didn't get the surgery. Like, can you go into the the office note? And some of our partners have really elaborate office notes and some office notes are like three sentences, right? You don't know if they offered them the surgery or not, right? Like if they're just like, okay, they'll let me know if they're going to want it or not, or now is maybe not the right time. You don't know who made that. Were they still willing to do it? Were they not? But the the other point and, and there are these these factors were reasons that they didn't undergo it or were not offered right. it. We yeah. don't have no idea. And the patient yeah. can be like, I have no way I want surgery. So, you know, forget about it. So it is difficult. And and I, I think some of what this shows or some of what this speaks to, and the challenge here is that we know from other literature in other areas like bariatric surgery, that that's that that's one of the main ones. Um cancer surgery as well that there are unintended consequences of guidelines that almost always guidelines tend to disadvantage uh, patients who are already at risk uh, in terms of disparities from a socioeconomic or racial ethnic standpoint. And, and that's kind of what you're, you're showing here as well. If we just said as a blanket statement, someone who doesn't meet the guidelines, they can't have the surgery. There's just, they won't get it there would be more racial ethnic minorities in our system impacted than there would be white patients. But then on the far side there, because they're not meeting the guidelines, they're also at greater risk of the, the adverse events. Um, so it's, it's a difficult place to be in. It's really a Scylla and Charybdis as far as. Ooh, I like that. I was going to say catch 22, but yes, that's even better. You're not the only well one in school, Ivy League education. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a biology major. I'm boring, <laughs> but I own up to it at least. <laughs> so I don't know. Tell me, tell me where, where, like, what are your, what are your thoughts about that, you know, very difficult place to navigate between? I mean, so it's one of those interesting things where there've been plenty of studies that go out there saying do cut off matter. Right. And there's a lot of, there's studies that show that by cutting off people with regards to, for example, hemoglobin A1C or BMI, we are restricting care to a potentially vulnerable part of the population. And so I think we're just trying to bring to light here the fact that um, these patients, while they get surgery, they might have an increased risk of complications afterwards. Doesn't mean everyone's getting complication. Of course, you've seen studies where BMI greater than 50 potentially can do just as well as patients who have BMI less than 40 or 45 or any sort of cutoff like that. But in, in our specific demographic of individuals in our, you know, tiny Northeast city, um, when we had the patients who did undergo surgery, so following our guidelines feels that it's probably a good thing, but really working to optimize our patients to help hopefully benefit their health in general, um, regardless of their socioeconomic background or their demographics and things like that, uh, can potentially be beneficial and can be a conversation to be had, you know, where a patient can be like, well, doc, you don't want me to have surgery because you don't like me, or you're, you're, you're prejudiced against me or something like that. And you're like, from a health perspective, we're shown that, look, when you bend the rules a little bit, it can lead to potential increased risk of complications. But the real way to do this study is to see what happens to patients who, you know, have these high immigrant A1C, are smoking, have high BMIs, and see whether or not if precluding surgery from them makes a difference in their outcomes or optimizing them makes a difference in terms of outcomes. So I think it's to bring awareness to this topic, which is a topic we do know about and discuss and looking at it in a different aspect, but not in the 100% best aspect if, if I could design my own study and make it perfect. I feel like if you brought this to like a health policy person, like CMS or something, and you ask them like, Okay, so what's going to be better? Follow the guidelines and have right. you know disparate impact on vulnerable populations, yep. or you know fudge on the guidelines and have potential worse outcomes. And I think you get a response. Like for those of us who have kids who are at the point where they're like thinking about like highly competitive, highly selective schools, and you'll ask like the college counselor. It's it's the conundrum around 
um, a very rigorous academic program in high school where they might not, you know, there's a greater chance of getting like a B plus versus an A. Would you, would you rather take all APs and get some B pluses or would you rather take mostly like honors classes and get all A's? And like the counselors are like, well, I'd rather you take the, the APs and get all A's. I mean, it's a very, you know, disingenuous and dissatisfying. I, I, I feel like the policy person would be like, follow the guidelines and also no disparate impact. Perfect. So right? if you have a billion dollars to make this happen or whatever it takes, right? So, right. In a, in a perfect world, that'd be great. And we know that's just not the case. So I'm with you. that's a great analogy. I like that one. Awesome. Another one for the, uh, for that, that's a harder one to like, uh, the, uh, the AP student analogy, right? We went, we got Kaiser Soze, we got Big Lebowski now, we got Jackie Childs. Now we have the AP student paradigm. Perfect. Yeah. All right. On to honorable mentions, because I think we might be running out of time. We had we had too much, too too many rich topics to to delve into, and there are, there are a lot of honorable mentions this week. All right, so three dimensional osseo integration patterns of cementless femoral stems, an ex vivo study with high resolution imaging and histological evaluation. This is by Schwartz and colleagues. This is uh, a um, kind of like a basic science study. They had four specimens <laughs> with varying degrees of bone quality and, and fixation characteristics from body donors who had uh, undergone uh, hip, who had received hip stems during their lifetime. Mean time in situ at the time of death was almost 13 years. And these were evaluated using radiographs, high resolution CT and hard tissue histology. And it, it discusses the different osteointegration patterns of cementless femoral stems on the basis of these various uh, evaluations. And, and they have some findings based on cortical bone volume and cortical thickness. And um, they postulate that these patterns and long-term survival of cementless stems are dependent on cortical bone volume and, and cortical thickness. Obviously, small, small number of specimens, but very difficult to do that kind of work otherwise. Then we have the radiographic thigh muscle measurements are a reliable predictor of psoas area and sarcopenia by Lurie and colleagues. This has a visual summary with 30 days free. This is from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, Running Rebels. Uh, it's the first in a long time that I think we've seen something at JBJS from uh, folks at UNLV. So that's always nice to see. This study included 414 patients. It's readily applicable to basically any aspect of orthopedic surgery, trauma, joint replacement, spine, oncology, because you know basically they're looking at thigh muscle size and found that this predicts both psoas muscle area and sarcopenia. And this can aid in the diagnosis and treatment of sarcopenia in um, the orthopedic population writ large. So um, real, real interesting study with a lot of intersections there. Then we have life course epidemiology of hip osteoarthritis in Japan, a multi-center cross-sectional study by uh, Sato and colleagues. This is permanently free. This is a large registry, national registry-based study looking at the effects of changes in the way the uh, Japanese society sought to uh, prevent developmental dysplasia of the hip between 1972 and 1973. And now looking at the effects of those individuals who are born at that time, how they're now developing hip osteoarthritis. So as of 2022, hip osteoarthritis due to hip dysplasia is still responsible for most new cases of adolescent and adult hip osteoarthritis seen in Japan uh, however, they do postulate that there have been some positive effects, potentially in terms of severity, particularly around severe subluxation. So um, a large population-based study that has some um, interesting paradigms. Then we have lateral unicompartmental knee arthroplasty for osteoarthritis, secondary to lateral meniscectomy, high functional results in survivorship, and low osteoarthritis progression at a mean 10-year of follow-up. This is by Marullo and colleagues. This study includes 42 patients who underwent lateral UKA for osteoarthritis secondary to lateral meniscectomy. Mean follow-up was 10.2 years. Uh, they conclude it's an effective treatment option for osteoarthritis secondary to lateral meniscectomy, providing functional, excellent functional outcomes and survivorship. 
And then finally, um, femoral tabular variations are predisposing factors for traumatic posterior hip dislocation by Regenbogen. Uh, this looks at acetabular and femoral morphology of 83 hips with traumatic posterior dislocation following high energy trauma. Uh, and they were compared to a match control of 83 patients. They found acetabular retroversion, posterior acetabular undercoverage, and CAM type FAI morphology are risk factors contributing to the risk of traumatic posterior hip dislocation. Wow, that was that was a lot. I think we covered a lot in this uh, episode of your cases on hold. Hopefully, Quite your case for is ready my to friend. go, or your workout's done, or your commute is over. If you like what you heard, please, again, like and subscribe. Give us a five-star rating. Find us wherever you find your podcasts. Tell a friend. Get someone else engaged in the gift of your cases on hold. And uh, come back next time for another fun-filled episode. We're out of time. We'll hope to do better next time. Again, hope your cases are ready to go. But the cases here, they're still on hold. <laughs> <laughs>